The next way you can make email bloody brilliant is with personalization and segmentation opportunities. Now, we're gonna to touch on just a couple high level points because this is really the meaty time consuming portion of how we actually generate return on investment from email marketing, but it often makes all the difference. So I don't want anybody to think that I'm just going through these slides for the sake of uh, not giving them the actual time and attention that they need but just due to time constraints, we're gonna to touch on some of the core elements around personalization and segmentation. And so some really great examples of what different brands are doing around the world. So included within here, you'll find 27 different segmentation opportunities, all the way that allows you to talk through to consumer segments as well as B2B segments. And these different segments are categorized into four segmentation pillars that start with geographic. So what is the digital DNA of the subscribers that are in your database. They move on to demographics. So those firmographic information that you can actually utilize, whether from first party or third party data that allows you to do segmentation across your list. Some psychographic uh, uh, segmentation opportunities, things like lifestyle, concerns, values, personality, or attitude. These are things we can do from a contextual perspective to actually change a lot of the content that's within our, within our campaigns and segment into those content opportunities. And the last one is behavioral related segmentation. Now this is really the digital body language of your subscriber. What are they doing on your website? What are they doing around your brand? So these are 27 different opportunities that we can use to start at, and at least start to think about how we segment uh, our, our databases of subscribers. Why does segmentation matter? Well, this slide should paint a picture. It's largely because when we do segment our customers before we send them content, we typically see a return on investment that's often higher. This study comes from the Optimove blog that looked at six months of retail segmentation across a number of brands from mid-market to enterprise-sized retail brands. And when they were sending lists to their entire set of customers that results, those results you see on the left-hand side, they saw a $28 uh, on average return on investment. But when they segmented by the spending habits of those particular subscribers, they saw a $42 return on investment. So segmentation can happen at any different moments within your subscription database or across different data sets, I should say. And it allows you to often drive higher return on investment on those campaigns. Now, some segmentation opportunities that you'll see in here, we can do segmentation based on uh, first name personalization inside of the user. So actually with inside the content of the email campaign, you'll see a great example here from native deodorants. Another way to do segmentation really effectively is to leverage tools that help make this easier for you as a marketer. And one of those tools is the, uh, is the tool that you're seeing in front of you. And this comes from uh, Movable Inc., which is a platform that allows you to take your database and your segmentation opportunities and then customize the content in real time based on those segments that you've created. And it does it all in the back end with a very easy line of code, and you're able to change any piece of content within the campaign. But this is how we can take those segmentation opportunities and actually deliver them in real time inside of email campaigns. Now we can segment based on also the user's behavior around us, such as the welcome series, and we'll touch on that a little bit later because it's an important series to talk about. We can onboard users through our organization, right? What do they need to know as a new customer or with a new feature or a new service? And then how do we educate them through the process of becoming a customer with us, right? At every step of the way. This is an example, example from the Xfinity brand, which uh, does internet connections in the US. Another way that we can send segment again is based on events or first party or third party data that we have on users, such as around our birthdays or events. Great example here from Core Power, which is a yoga brand based in the US, right? Rolling out that particular opportunity, in this case, delivering content based on the user's birthday. Here's an example of just a small business based in Los Angeles that does this as well uh, for a variety of customers. We can also segment based on people's intent. So what are they intending to do? These were those behavioral segments that we saw on the right-hand side of those segmentation pillars. In this case, purchase or intent or cart abandonment. These are two different ways that we can segment campaigns. On the left-hand side, you see from our friends at Amazon, actually knowing when, because you're logged in the site, knowing what products you're looking at, and then delivering campaigns based on how long you spend on those product pages, what are your intentions on those product pages, do you put things in the cart or do, don't you, and why. And then on the right-hand side from Bonobos, this is an example of when a user, when a person actually puts a piece of, or a product inside the cart and then doesn't purchase, right? So doing those cart abandonment emails and delivering those segments based on what that user is doing. Here's another good example from Bonobos, which is a men's only online fashion retailer. 
Um, they're actually segmenting and con and actually personalizing base basing the segment on the user size on the on the actual sizes that that individual has bought in the past. So this is a campaign for the Riviera short sleeve shirt, and the call to action the button there says shop size large. So they're segmenting the users based on how what particular size that they've purchased, and then delivering content that's based on those segments in a personalized way inside of the campaigns. We can also deliver personalized campaigns based on offline experiences. This is a really great ex example from Apple, which customizes their content by the actual name and what product you purchased inside the store. So in this case, this was an experience with a Genius Bar rep, which is their customer service uh, uh, sort of help, in help, in-person help desk inside of their stores. And you can see right here, they're personalizing based on uh, the actual individual you talk to in the store. So subject line says, how was your experience with Zach? That's the name of the customer service rep. And then actually doing that inside of the campaign itself. We can do things based on pre and post events. So attendance to events, this is a really great uh, personalization and segmentation opportunity for B2B, right? You're going into a trade show, you're doing a conference and educating people before they come into the conference and educating them after. And we can also segment and deliver personalized content based on location of users. This is an example from Tommy John, which bases your shipping address and provides you with some contextually relevant content around where you can actually go find that particular piece of clothing based on where your last shipping address was that you shared with them through their e-commerce experience. We can also customize by weather. This is not, again, an example from that last brand, Tommy John. So delivering content based on when people are actually experiencing something that's related to our products. In this case, they wanna deliver content that's based on uh, uh, specific weather events, in this case, a snowstorm, and delivering you products that work well within a snowstorm. We can also segment and deliver personalized content based on value. This is a great example from x.ii, which, uh, which allows users to essentially hook up a, uh, a um, digital calendar where they can send a link out to users and you can coordinate your schedule around, uh, you can coordinate your schedule to have a meeting. And every single week they're delivering a summary that's completely automated, personalized for the individual user that's actually using the platform for them specifically. As you can see, the content here has personalization elements right within the salutation, good morning, Michael, and then actually shows you within the content of the campaign uh, which particular events that they helped you schedule for this past week. The other opportunity we can do from a segmentation and personalization perspective is actually delivering content that's based on real-time information that's happening within the user's life. This is another example from Nest, which delivers content based on all the products that you have in your home that's connected from an Internet of Things per perspective, so connected into Wi-Fi, and they're actually delivering content into these campaigns based on what's happening within people's homes. Another segmentation opportunity is actually to drive product adoption. This is an example from Proactive, which is a skincare company that's based in the US. What Proactive understands is that if they can get you to use the product within the first six weeks of their campaigns, they're two or three times more likely to have you using that product almost a year later. And so for the first six weeks, they deliver information right in the inbox as to what you can expect from the product within that particular week. In this case, they're personalizing based on the second week and they're showing you exactly what to expect from the product inside of their campaigns. Another segmentation opportunity is based on transactions. And one thing that we often see within transactional email campaigns is they're fairly boring. We don't think about these campaigns being important, but that's just not the case. They actually matter quite a bit. We've seen in recent studies, they are typically read or engaged with eight times more, or they're more than eight times more likely to be engaged with than our promotional emails. So things like order confirmations, shipping confirmations, returns and exchanges, all of those emails people are reading probably more regularly based on the research that we see than the promotional campaigns. Now, one little thing that we can be doing within these campaigns is giving our users more information. And in this case, Bonobos actually delivers a video on cats. Now, this video has nothing to do with the Bonobos brand by any stretch of the imagination. But what Bonobos has found is when they include these little Easter eggs, these links to things that are really, really interesting and often comical, is it actually has a downline impact on other people opening their promotional related campaigns. Again, this has nothing to do with Bonobos, but they deliver these really interesting tidbits inside of their transactional campaigns because they know that users find these interesting and, and it drives people to open their non-promotional, excuse me, their non-transactional campaigns more often. So this is this idea of being bloody brilliant around the inbox. 
The next one is this. So this is this idea of always being kind, and I think there's a real clear way that we can deliver em empathy inside the inbox through a couple of key tactics. And that starts with always saying hello. What I mean by that is that we deliver really interesting and impactful welcome campaigns, because welcome campaigns are one of the most read campaigns that your subscribers are gonna look at. Based on rates that we've seen over the past few years, four times higher open rate, five times higher click-through rate, and 33% increase in long-term engagement when you deliver a welcome series into the inbox. And those are no real surprise, right? Because when someone is just subscribed to your campaigns, they are, right, they are attuned to actually, they're waiting to actually see content from you right away. So that's why you're typically seeing higher conversion opportunities or higher engagement opportunities, I should say, with these welcome series. Now, this is often just table stakes for most of us, but what we found is at least 40% of companies are not sending these welcome series campaigns. And what's important about these is, is when you don't deliver them, you will typically get uh, net new subscribers unsubscribing more often than within lists that actually deliver really cohesive welcome series. And from a timing perspective, we wanna make sure that they go out as quickly as possible because typically real-time emails, those that are going out within about a 60 second window of that subscription, are 10 times higher to have, 10 times higher engagement rates than those that are just batched or delivered within an hour and outside of that window. So some easy tactics that we can utilize around the welcome series. Say hello, right? What is the story behind your brand? Simply welcoming the user into the subscription experience. We can help people get started, right? What is the next step that you would like them to take in the process with your business? How do they get to know your business? How do they actually utilize the product or service that they have subscribed to? Now, we often see retailers especially deliver offers into the welcome series, but I would just caution you here, but be very careful about leveraging offers because you will set up the relationship with a subscriber for them to expect to have offers delivered into their inbox consistently. Here's one example from uh, Taylor Stitch, which is a men's label that's based out of uh, San Francisco. They offer 20% off your first purchase when you become a member of their subscription campaigns, a member of their email family. Here is a great example from Airtable, which is sort of like an Excel-based product in the cloud. So Airtable does uh, a variety of things really, really well and helps businesses be more productive. And over the course of their welcome series, which you'll see right here, they do four emails within that series across about a nine to 11 day window. This is the first one and they tell you, hey, here's a simple welcome. The second one, they do social proof. So they show you case studies of different organizations that look like yours that say, hey, here's a case study of how this particular brand has leveraged our platform. The next two that they deliver over that first nine to 11 days is around features. And look at all the great things that they're including in here. They've got emojis in the subject line. They've got GIFs showing off the features of the actual platform appropriately sized headlines, appropriately sized body copy, and of course, clear calls to action on what they would like to do within those campaigns. The next idea around this idea of being empathetic is to be human, because at the end of the day, this is about ensuring that users feel like this is a one-to-one -one, uh, experience. So how do we go about being human inside the inbox? The first idea or the first tactic I would suggest is speak like a human being, right? I think gone are the days when people can uh, be in their inbox and expecting and expect to see a lot of sales and marketing gobbledygook. I think you've got to deliver a human-based story that speaks to your personas and speaks to your audiences like a human being. There are a couple key examples in here from a variety of different companies. The next idea around this idea around this concept of being human is always say sorry if you make a mistake in the inbox. We often see when mistakes are made, whether you deliver an incorrect offer or a lack of offer, or maybe you've personalized incorrectly. When you ignore those, you typically see a higher un unsubscribe rate and engagement rate, but in the wrong ways, people replying to your campaigns to let you know that you've made a mistake. So when you do make a mistake inside of the inbox, always send a follow-up campaign to those that received uh, that particular issue. Asking you shall receive is another great tactic around this idea of being human. And it's specifically around this context of asking users what they want to receive. <clears throat> this is a great example from the New York Times, which has 53 different options or subscriptions that users can sign up to. Now, often we're told that when we give users more options, they will not actually take the actions that we're looking them to do. But what the New York Times has proved is that this is actually not the case. So they actually see anywhere from a 70 to 80% open rate 
and a 40 to 50% click-through rate even when they're giving users all of these options. So ask people what they want to receive. This next tactic around always be human um, is tell people or ask people what they want their frequency preferences to do. So this is a great example from Bonobos. And this is their unsubscribe page. So it, rather than asking you, hey, never email me again, like we saw from that, uh, from that example in the beginning of the presentation, Bonobos asks you how much Bonobos do you want in your life? And look at the frequency options that they're offering right here. How about once a week, let's take it slow. Or unsubscribe, sniff, it's over Bonobos, right? So allow the user to tell you when they want to receive your particular piece of content. And if I want out, please make it easy. So in this, again, in this idea of burying our unsubscribe, we've got to allow users an easy way to get out of our subscription databases if they don't wanna be there anymore. Because when they don't have an easy way to get out of it that we direct, they take other options such as the instant unsubscribe and worse, mark as spam. So give users easy ways to get out of your campaigns. The last example or tactic I wanna uh, suggest is give people reasons to stay. When someone unsubscribes, what are we doing or offering them to potentially continue to subscribe? Now, this is a great but older example from Groupon. And if you're not familiar with Groupon, it's a platform that offered daily emails that sent you offers for ridiculously low lunch experiences or products and discounts and offers off of them. Now, back when Bonobo started, one of the most important tactics they had was their email campaigns. They figured out that for every person that the value of a subscriber was approximately $43 of potential revenue per month. So if they lost a subscriber, this was actually a really big impact on their organization long term. So when someone unsubscribed, this was the video that Groupon would show. They'd say, hey, you're unsubscribed. We're sorry to see you go. How sorry? Well, we want to introduce you to Derek. He's the guy that thought you'd enjoy receiving the email from us. And you see his coworker stroll into this video and then throws what you assume is hot or cold water on Derek and walks away. Now, this video is meant to be impactful and funny, but as that coworker exits stage right, you can see that the call to action here, that was pretty mean. I hope you're happy, want to make it up to Derek. And for the first eight months after this launched, they saw a resubscribe rate of 40%. Now, the next tactic that I'll suggest or this idea of being all, uh, this empathetic experience is always make sure you're testing because that ensures you're delivering the content people want and the experience they want inside the campaign. So how do we test and offer different opportunities and understand the impacts of those testing opportunities inside the in inbox? First things first is always start with a hypothesis. Don't test without making some educated guesses. Figure out what are you trying to impact? Are you trying to impact open rate? Are you trying to impact click-through rate? Are you simply trying to impact engagement overall or conversions outside of the inbox? Make sure you're testing automated and operational emails. So those automated emails that you sent, you set up, those drips or those programs that you set up, make sure that you're testing those particular campaigns too. We often see brands that are only testing their promotional campaigns a significant amount of brands only test their open their, their, those promotional campaigns, and we should be doing testing, structured testing within our operational and automated emails as well. Focus on tests that move the needle, right? If you're looking for eyeballs, then we're focusing on the open rate. If you're looking for clicks, then you're focusing on that click-through rate, and you're focusing on the elements that impact those. For open, it's from name, subject line. From the click-through rate, it's content within the campaigns themselves, right? What do your headlines look like? What are the images that you're using? What's the conversion opportunities? Limit test to one thing at a time, right? Don't try and do multivariate testing inside of the inbox. Test individual elements, then take the impacts of those tests and put them together and try some multivariate options. But at the beginning, you want to think about limiting your test to one thing at a time, or you're gonna be conflating the impacts of those tests. Test audience segments that are similar and different. This again is this idea that you have to understand when you're taking just a simple percentage of your subscription list, you are often pulling in different segments of people. So your testing elements, the things that you're testing should be on specific segments within your subscription database. And one of those particular segments, this, this idea, or excuse me, this segment of active subscribers is particularly different and behaves very, very different and can give you some interesting opportunities and results from those testing, from those different tests that you're running. Active subscribers are the people you're gonna wanna impact the most. Those are the people that are more engaged with your, your particular brand inside the inbox. You've gotta define what those active subscribers are, right? Are they people that open every 30 days, 60 days, 90 days? What is that time window? 
and then make sure that you're testing your elements against those active subscribers because those are the people that you're gonna to wanna to impact the most. Always ensure your testing groups are statistically significant. Typically, we wanna see at least a subscription level of about 10,000 or more subscribers to get an accurate result from our tests. And make sure that you're sharing test results everywhere. Don't keep those test results siloed just amongst your email team. You wanna share those with other parts of your marketing team because they can have interesting impacts for things like search campaigns or display ads or other parts or other content opportunities that you're sharing uh, from your organization. So let's recap. What would mom tell us to help make email amazing? First, authentication, prove who you are. The second is design. This is this idea of being ubiquitous across the platforms that our subscribers, our people are reading our campaigns in. The third is subject lines, get better or be boring. Understand it's not about subject line length. It's about things like diversity, sentiment, and the simplicity of your messages and potentially leveraging emojis in those subject lines too. Interactivity, this is this idea that we can go well beyond the flat JPEG and text experience and deliver real interesting content opportunities like the GIF or interactive content experiences inside of the inbox. Segmentation and personalization, it's what matters. It's what gets people to feel like you're having a one-to-one -one communication experience with them because you're doing it based on who they are and how they're behaving around your brand. Always say hello because it's polite. It's what your mother taught you, if you remember that. And it works, right? We know that it has big downline impacts, not only immediately as they subscribe, but also on the lifetime value of that customer through the inbox. And lastly, be human, but be a scientist, right? Talk normally around your subscribers, to your subscribers, with your subscribers, but get nerdy around the data and testing elements that are within your campaigns. Now, we started with this idea of why during the presentation at the beginning of the keynote uh, at the start of the day, but why take mom's advice? And I wanna leave you again with three impactful reasons of why. Number one, engagement matters inside the inbox. When we are dealing, when we, excuse me, when we are delivering a timely, targeted and relevant experience, we deliver engagement and that is what matters for us from, an, from a deliverability and from an impact perspective and where the ISPs, the internet service providers are going to put us in the inbox. So those ISPs, those internet service providers get together every three years on a council. It's called the Email Experience Council and they tell us what matters. And what they told us a few years ago was really, really important. So I wanna to touch on those. One, opens. It's a less relevant metric because obviously you have on certain platforms images downloading by default, but the ISPs still track it. It is still a somewhat positive correlation to a measure of engagement for them. Clicks. Now, the Email Experience Council has told us that they don't measure clicks as a form of engagement. So one of the things to think about is what's the downline impact of that potentially on our deliverability? Three, replies. This is this idea of uh, someone actually replying to your email campaign. And what the Email Experience Council has told us is this is a super strong signal of engagement. So another reason why we shouldn't be using that no reply at is because of this. But also we should potentially be monitoring and ensuring that those replies that are coming from our subscribers are being handled and replied to. If we aren't, we're probably potentially mitigating some issues from a deliverability perspective. When someone moves something from junk or spam or moves something from their inbox to junk or spam, I should say, this is a super strong signal of negative engagement. When they pull us out of spam, this is a super positive signal of engagement. The delete without open was also something that the email experience noted a few years ago. And this is this idea that when you take a quick glance at the sender subject line and decide on whether, whether that user is gonna open or not, this can actually be a somewhat negative signal if they do it fairly quickly. So make sure we're optimizing your from names and your subject lines. Those things matter from an engagement perspective. When someone moves you from the inbox into a folder, this is considered a super strong signal of engagement. They're caring about the message. They're putting it somewhere to reference later. Now, one of the things that's also interesting is that they're actually monitoring people based on the user level rather than on the email address level. And so make sure that you're looking at those, those users as active subscribers, those people that where they're actually measuring, where you're actually measuring most of your metrics across an aggregate or macro level, they're measuring it across all of the individual subscription level. And what that means is that engagement for the ISPs is measured at the subscriber level. And it's based on metrics that some of us aren't quite tracking yet. 
So what I would encourage us to do is to get as close as possible to our subscriber level metrics rather than just look at the macro level metrics as well. Number two is this idea that the future matters. I showed you some examples earlier in the presentation around this idea of the web coming to the inbox or vice versa, right? We're seeing these sorts of examples of the Google AMP platform delivering truly engaged emails, or excuse me, engagement, engaging content opportunities inside of the inbox. But what happens when we start to pair those things together? What happens when Gmail all of a sudden rolls out a cart experience like we see right here? This is just FPO, just for placement only in this case. Um, and we have some of the examples that we saw in the, uh, in the presentation earlier, like the Nest cart example where we can deliver not only a truly engaging experience inside the inbox, one that they can interact with, but then they can buy right within the inbox itself. And the downline impact is this, is that if we haven't taken advantage of emails, uh, of what we're doing right now, presently within inside the inbox, we will not be able to take advantage of all of these interesting inter integrations that are happening within the inbox moving forward. And the last one, and this is where the conversation comes right back to mom, is that familiarity rules. Now, I've already introduced you to this woman, right? Now, as I've mentioned before during our conversation, my mom is a really interesting character. The things that she cares about these days are her dogs, her husband, and her kids at this point as a retiree. And one of the things that she works on day in, day out is Westie Rescue, which is a breed-specific rescue group based in California. Now, she's in charge of fundraising for that rescue group. And one of the more interesting things and the experience that I've had with her over the past few years around being this fundraising chair is her constantly bringing uh, questions and examples to me about how do I go about marketing these fundraising experience. Now she calls all the time with, how do I do this on Instagram? How do I do this on Facebook? But literally the only thing she's never called about in 26 years of me being in this industry and knowing a little bit about this industry is the inbox, right? It is the one place that people actually understand. And I think that's really, really important to for us to consider as marketers because it is truly the one digital place that we understand and know how to control. Comparatively to everything else that we're being bombarded with from brands, the inbox is an area where we seemingly think we have control over our experience with content and with brands. When we look in social media, we don't have that. It's dominated by algorithms and potentially security and privacy flaws that we're confronting as we speak. But the inbox is the one place we understand and know how to control. And I think that's a really important thing for us to understand as marketers is this idea that familiarity rules. So thank you for your time. I appreciate the opportunity to come visit you all in Denmark and, and for the 15 or 20 so minutes that I provided after the session. Again, if you have any questions on this presentation would like to follow up, my contact information is right there in the left-hand side. Thank you again to Meta and the entire team at the email summit. And I wish you nothing but the best in your continued experience inside this channel inside of this tactic of email. Take care.